Okay, welcome to the Team Black uh, subsidiary of DigTech LLC, but this is Team Black webinar, and I am Chris Webster. I'm your host, and I'm the founder and operator of Team Black. I will start this out by saying if you are an expert in something related to archaeology and history, like our esteemed expert here, uh, Dr. Alan Garfinkel, then please contact me. You can contact me at my DigTech address, Chris Webster at digtech-llc.com, and I will get you hooked up. Um, we will have you put a webinar on here. It's pretty simple. You can see how it's done and, uh, and we can go from there. We're always looking for new content. And, um, if you're watching this in the relatively recent time frame, uh, we're getting a subscription site ready to go for 2019 and, uh, people will be able to see the back catalog and you'll get some good royalties off of that. So, all right, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, Dr. Garfinkel and he is going to tell us all about today's topic. Dr. Gar Dr. Garfinkel, go ahead. Hey, Chris Webster. Thank you so much. I'm honored to continue in this vein to share uh, in the Archaeological Podcast Network and Team Black and uh, doing these webinars. This is the third webinar we've done, and this is uh, one of two in a, in a series focusing on Native American religion. Uh, it's an overview, and we're going to uh, take a deep dive into some of the intricacies of Native American cosmology, religion, uh, the religious metaphor, and the nature of the way that Native people think about the world. So in this vein, I'm going to talk about, in a broad sense, at least to begin, what is distinctive about Native American people versus, let's say, the industrial, the Western way in which contemporary people think about the universe, think about the world, and conduct their affairs. So for most of prehistory, in fact, most uh, people were hunter-gatherers. These were foragers who moved about the landscape and they uh, followed the availability of key economic resources, both uh, plants and animals, and moved with the seasons and followed the uh, game and the plants. And when those animals and plants were available to them, they would acquire and harvest those or maximize their efforts. They, in essence, lived off the land. And as I said, they, they did time those movements to this differential availability of these key economic plants and animals. Now, since they were so tied to the land and the landscape and their subsistence, their, what they ate, and what they acquired in terms of their food was directly related to the natural environment. And so as a key correlate to that, there was this intimate and direct connection between the natural world and native people. A very close relationship ensued between the land, the animals, the plants, and most importantly for what we would turn their religion the cosmos, the natural world, and the celestial universe. And this was rather different in our own culture. I think it's uh, difficult or nearly impossible for us to appreciate and understand the indigenous way of thinking. And we'll talk about some of the disparities and the difficult for me, in fact, even someone who's a student of this kind of culture and kind of life way and religious behavior. Even after 40 years, I don't think I really have a, a true grasp of, of the intricacies and the different elements of Native American religion, but I'm going to give it a shot. So in contemporary industrial society, literate people, literate nations, um, are rather divorced. They're rather uh, cut away and not connected to the natural world. We get our food from the market, we buy our feed at the our meat at the butchers, or we go to the grocery store, we turn our faucet on and get some water. If you want to know the time, we look on our, on our uh, clock or our calendar on the wall in terms of the day. And all of those things are second nature to us. Our homes and offices are insulated with elements from heating and air conditioning, creating these comfortable environs when we look to the heavens. You know, we can't see often a star-filled sky due to light pollution or other considerations. And we don't uh, identify with or feel intimately connected with the movements of stars, 
uh, the moon, the sun. And uh, I'm as aware of that as anyone in terms of not being truly connected to the natural world. As, uh, as a member of the industrial society, we are rather mobile. We only are loosely attached to the local geography. We tend to live in many different places throughout our lives. And we're a very literate society, so we end up reading labels to identify things, look for the printed word for information. And yet oral communications, meaning through sound, is becoming uh, less and less central sometimes. And also this more literate way of connecting with the other mediums of communication is very, very different than it is in indigenous society. So this communication in words is a constant, uh, something constant to us in our industrial society, which de-emphasizes the sounds and the senses in the natural world. We ignore sounds of animals, birds, owls, songbirds, mammals, coyotes, other in insects, the cicada, or the natural sound of wind, water, and rain. We can't uh, embrace those because often there's so much buzz and sound and other exotic input that goes around our world, we're constantly bombarded. So the natural world sounds, which are central to native peoples, indigenous people all over the world, are no longer incorporated in the life ways and in the pattern, the harmony of our existence. So when we think about Native American religions, uh, often our culture, our industrialized Western civilization, looks at them as being rather simple, rather, they use the word primitive, which is really a, a pejorative, a, a negative term, or even, in, or even they might say it's silly. I would say even those that uh, today are passionately religious are sometimes viewed in that same realm. Yet, even our so-called major world religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, if you look deeply into the central spiritual ideas and religious metaphors, you will find uh, striking similarities and commonalities, similar metaphors, with the very ancient uh, Native American religions. Uh, Ake Holtkrantz, a um, prominent anthropologist who has studied world religions and published extensively on this particular concept, calls them hunting religions. And we'll talk a bit about that concept as well. So world religions and hunting religions or forager religions hunters and gatherers have a lot of similarities with them. First of all, there's a central principle of sacrifice or propitiation. What does propitiation mean? It means uh, finding some way to uh, connect with the divine, connect with the supernatural, uh, find a, uh, a way to venerate and offer oneself and provide a conduit of this sort of communication. As well, we find that there's a cycle to our lives. We, we're born, we die, and then in some ways, religiously, we may be reborn, reborn through water, reborn through revelation. We're transformed. Some of us believe that there is a heaven, just like there's a hell, and that if we live a good life and follow the commandments of a deity, that we may actually make it to heaven and be immortal. There's a covenant, a formalized relationship, an agreement or contract between our deity and the way in which we should conduct our affairs. This is an agreement. This is a relationship. This is a ongoing communication. In world religions and hunting religions, there's many metaphors of light and darkness, 
light being the good, darkness being the bad. There are priests and ritualists and ritual specialists. In our modern day world, we might call them rabbis or ministers. In the indigenous community, they might be priests or shamans. There are ceremonials, also called first fruits. We have holidays called Easter or Christmas or even Halloween. These are, have ancient ties to indigenous people and they were related to uh, world renewal cults and the winter solstice and the worshiping or veneration of the dead. In another realm, we have something called rites of passage. These are ceremonial, ritual events where we celebrate birth. We also uh, find a way to venerate or, or deal with the sorrow of death. We also have what's called coming of age rites, confirmation, baptism, quinceañeras, marriage, first communion. Again, these are all benchmarks in our lifetimes about a particular role that we play in our lives. Other elements that are comparable with world religions and hunting religions are the concepts of ritual, sacrifice, singing, dancing, oral traditions, covenant, light, dark, flesh and blood, ritual priests as intermediaries, meaning that they have a connection with the supernatural, with the divine, with the ethereal. Ritual costumes that we see when priests are dressed in their appropriate garb. And then we have ceremonial instruments. We might have the crook or the, the shepherd's staff or some sort of a wand or other insignia that represents a esteemed connection between ritualists and their role as connecting us to the supernatural, the divine, the ethereal. Prayer is a central element, both to indigenous people and to those that are passionately religious. Caves and portals to the supernatural and entrances to the ethereal worlds of the divine. There are many places in the world where we have caves or portals that are shrines and recognized to this very day as important places where supernatural, miraculous play, uh, things have occurred and they are worshiped because we believe that through those places, God has stepped into historic time and transformed those places so that the miraculous can occur there. I think about the shrines in France or the caves that have been associated with miraculous springs, all of those kinds of areas that even in contemporary society are powerful places. For citizens, for making a living, for gathering food, we find that in indigenous cultures, in Native American cultures, gathering of economic plants and hunting of key animal foods was always a direct result of our energies. These were the efforts of both the men and women of particular households. When we rely on that acquisition, we can only eat what they harvest or what they were killed. Now, if the natural world was not cooperating and there was a drought or a bad season or a lack of some sort of key economic food, such as pinyon nuts or acorns, that could have tremendous adverse effects on a native people they might starve or face death just because of their lack of these key economic resources. With Native American culture and the way that they believe or the way they think about the cosmos and the natural world, large game animals, which were difficult to hunt and kill, sometimes played a central role in their thinking about the universe. So big game animals were important, not only for their food value, but for their religious importance. Of course, it took great skill and patience to hunt and successfully acquire 
such key animals. They were big meat packages, mountain sheep, deer, pronghorn, antelope, etc. These were considered windfall animals when we could bag a deer or kill a sheep. It might be an exceptionally abundant time for them, and meat was a very valuable commodity. Given the intimate nature of connecting to the natural world and the way in which they conducted their affairs, when someone died or when an animal was died, they intimately connected with that as part of the life of their lives. So that life and death was always a step away. It was, it was right there in front of their faces. They knew that it was possible at any moment that they would have to kill an animal or that someone from their group would die and they would have to deal with death as a significant element of their lives. Water was, of course, critically important and was considered almost energetic or a lifeblood to Native people. Often they'd have to live near a natural source of water and, find, and sort of work on getting their particular uh, villages and temporary camps situated so they could always have access to the lifeblood of these Native people water. If they moved far afield and could not find portable water, they could die. And, and the time of drought and the drying up of the springs could mean, of course, death to people. Indigenous people timed their movements to the seasons. And they were very aware of the movement of the stars in the heavens, the movement of the moon across the sky and the sun. And these were tracked by religious specialists. So when we think about a particular foraging culture, in some instances there were specialized priests who were sun watchers or star gazers. They would identify with the changing of the moon. They would track the sun. And so when the sun was in the heavens and it moved and it was winter solstice, they would then have a benchmark that they would know that there was a particular time in the seasons that the sun would stop and it would stop in the heavens and then turn around and go the other way. So time was cyclic, not linear. And there was a way of thinking about time that was very, very different from the way we think about it now. It was as though time was something that continued and that there was a continuous connection between those that came before and those that come after. So for instance, ancestors who had passed away were still connected to the people and often venerated. And there were means by which that they would be prayed to or connected with, or in some cases, even spoken to. And so by this connection, this, this sort of a supernatural tether, there was a link between the past, the present, and even the future. Homes were interim dwellings. They were often temporary and simple, and so they weren't permanent. They would have to be places where they could erect a temporary home and then move it somewhere else. Sun, heat, wind, and cold were all forces that had to be incorporated into their daily routine. And the landscape was not simply a uh, solid, natural, uh, non-enculturated, non-lively uh, canvas. They were beings, entities, forces that lived in the land, on the land, and within the land. And so as they viewed the landscape, a particular landform, a spring, a mountain, a hill, a past, there would be stories, oral traditions, and there would be 
understandings of how those beings lived within those caves, within those springs, within those areas. And they were named for those particular stories. And that was part of the religious cosmology. Importantly, very importantly, animals were perceived differently than we do today. Animals were what we call ensouled beings. What I mean by that is animals were people. They had souls, they had spirits, and they were on the same playing field, the same caliber as people. So the religions of native peoples were directly linked to the land. Places on the landscape were named and considered alive. They were inhabited by supernatural beings or forces. And so a particular spring might have uh, some sort of a creature living there or some sort of a spirit. And when one when went there, you could hear the words and sounds of that being. People spent most of their time within a defined territory throughout their lifetimes. And for many, many generations, they continued the same experiences and they wrote their stories on the land, as it said. Ancestors, those that came before them, were venerated. They were recognized. They were seen as those that had passed but still exist in a cosmic world, often in a sky world. And they often were considered spiritual beings and immortals. Sometimes they're almost called shamanistic ancestor deities because some of those prominent ancestors could be seen as partaking and becoming key figures within the cosmology, the religious pantheon of native people. The rocks, the trees, the mountains, all these various forms, land forms, were animated. They were alive with supernatural force. They were filled with otherworldly power. Now this kind of thinking that the landscape and other things that we considered inanimate is called animism. And this animism, this new animism, this animistic ontology is very, very characteristic of native people. Indigenous people, natives, saw the natural world as one that was transfixed by what, what I'm calling power. Power was a, a, a cosmic engine. It was a force to be hooked into a divine connection. And for native people, pre-contact, pre-religious, pre-literate people, religion was not something that was distinct or separate domain for everyday life. It was one and the same. They didn't have a word for religion. Religion, in, set, in, in essence, was a cosmic understanding of their connections and calling into the world. And these religious ideas were interfingered into every aspect of their existence. So when we think of power in nature, power is described and characterized through rituals, through these oral traditions, which are also use the term mythology, through ceremonials, through these coming of age rites, through childbirth, marriage, seasonal celebrations. This was all part of our inter interconnected way of thinking about the world and connecting with a celestial realm, a supernatural realm, a cosmic nature to feel the divinity of the world within one's life. Call it the web of life, call it a worldview, call it what you have. Every object, be it something as, as simple as a rock or a cave or a spring or a lake, was embodied with this animate, this, this animation, this agency of power. This was not simply a metaphor for anything every day, but this was a true reality. And so as one conducts their affairs, 
and viewed the landscape, one could then hook into or capture this sense of divinity. Humans were recognized as an indispensable part of nature. They were not something that was independent of nature. There wasn't just humanity and the natural world. Humans were seen as receiving this divinity, this divine power from perhaps a guardian spirit or a spirit helper. And all individuals could hook into this or reach this particular alternate reality, this supernatural element and glean these spirits to help them throughout their life. Both the uh, elevated ritualists and any, any standard person could seek a vision. They could travel to a sacred place. They could go to a spot associated with power. They could sit there and talk to the mountains. They could commune with nature and they could search for a connection to the divine and receive help from a spirit, a spirit animal, or some sort of a alternate creature that they could capture in their dreams or in their visions. These were called vision quests, these experiences I'm talking about. And there was various means that uh, people used to acquire these visions. Sometimes they use certain instruments such as drums. They might glean these visions when they talked to the mountains. They might go on a fast. They might dance and sing. Or alternatively, they could use a means for obtaining this alternate states of consciousness by taking certain psychotropic uh, drugs. They might use native tobacco. They might uh, ingest red ants that would be uh, covered up with eagle down. They might uh, go naked and go through uh, nettles. Many different means of acquiring this alternate state of consciousness and connecting to the supernatural. This power, this cosmic energy from the natural world was, was uh, manifested and seen, recognized through dreams. And you could have these dreams where you're awake or you're asleep. They're called visions. These dreams and visions were real. They were, they were considered almost inseparable from human thought and speech. And that when one garnered a dream or vision, it was considered a sign and a tangible phenomenon and that when one speaks or thinks and manifests something, one can speak in a way, and speaking and thinking and directing that communication results in practical realities and affects the nature of the world, the actions, the particular conduct of the cosmos. So speaking and thinking affects reality. In other words, wishes come true. Prayer was often considered akin to thought, and power from this natural world was communicated frequently, predominantly, as a song. Sometimes power might be communicated with words and instructions as a dance. Power is this life force that was constantly moving and flowing, this dynamic energy of the universe. In the Star Wars movies, when it says, Luke, use the force. <laughs> this was a popular culture way of trying to understand this alternate reality that is part of indigenous Native American cosmology and thought. How do we access that power in nature? Well, we do it through song, dance, and words that can influence the natural world. The recognition of power, power goes in a circular path from nature to people and people to nature. This powerful engine, this energy is something that needs to be respected and has the potential to be ben beneficial as well as dangerous. In the Great Basin, the desert west of the uh, Shoshone and Paiute world in the desert west, 
this power is called puha or buha. And power was especially resident with ritualists and priests, the ritual adepts, people we call shamans. If we are to revere this power and this force of nature, and we overlook it, if we forget to conduct ourselves appropriately, we can invite disaster. Terrible things can happen if we don't revere, respect, acknowledge, and do the proper rituals that keep us in attunement and alignment with the natural world. So the dark underside of this power, of course, is sorcery, using the power for evil intentions. And there are dark world, underworld forces, and they are recognized in indigenous world. Sometimes they're called water babies. And whirlwind spirits, they had the power to kill and could embody these dangerous and powerful uh, forces that could affect humankind in a very deleterious way. When we're looking at Native American religions, especially hunters and gatherers, foragers, the best way to characterize them is to say that they're animistic and shamanistic. Shaman is an individual who, through uh, a natural calling or inheritance, takes on a proper role, a role of being a religious specialist, a ritual adept, someone who is the interface or intermediary, the liaison between the world of the supernatural, the word of the divine, the ethereal, and the natural world. These are the religious leaders. These were the people that had uh, respect from their community because they were perceived as having the ability to harness the agents of these other worlds, these supernaturals, to communicate with the supramundane beings, with the divine, with the deities and harness the agents of this natural world. These shamans, these ritualists, use the power from nature and act as healers, uh, medicine men and women, and Indian doctors. It is interesting that often we think of shaman as being men, but in many cultures throughout the world, many foragers, and even uh, throughout the Americas, these particular calling were women and not necessarily men. Many of them were healers and they believed that illness, sickness was often caused by sorcery or irreverence, disrespect against the supernatural. So what the shamans had to do is call upon their spirits, the spirit helpers, their guardians, which were often animals, often birds, or other prominent animal creatures, I call them indexical animals, central animals that were both good to think and good to have as compatible support and resources. They were acquired during periods of time when a native individual, a ritualist, shaman, a ritual adept, would acquire these uh, resources, these, these sources of alternative uh, world beings in trance, in the trance state, when they were in and seeing and experiencing a different kind of universe. These shamans were pivotal. They were central leaders in their communities. Sometimes they were headmen. They were village, uh, you know, priests. They were religious leaders, but they also sometimes were actually the chiefs of the particular groups. And they were responsible uh, for pre-hunting ceremonials that charmed game and brought luck to the hunters. They would also sing hunting songs. They would go into trance and be able to predict exactly where the animals would be. They would play musical instruments that could attract game. They would lead these ceremonies, wearing certain animal costumes, imitating the movements of animals. These costumes including skulls, feathers, skin, claws, and bones. 
and they might fall into an ecstatic trance and capture the animal's soul and work with them in a pre-hunt fashion so that when the hunters went out to kill game, they were already docile and also amenable to the acquisition skills of the native people. Certain shamans could control weather, weather shamans. They bring rain, snow, and stop the wind. These are people who are called upon and felt calling and a connection to these weather deities, these weather entities. And such actions, when they were called upon to create the rain, to stop the snow, to stop the wind, were proof of their rapport with the spirits and they would then be revered even more. How did they glean these particular skills? Well, through dreams, they would receive those powers, and these powers in turn would benefit the community through these specialized connections. And they would also be very intimately familiar with the life cycles of both the plants and animals. These shamans, these religious adepts, were this class of people who really helped to orchestrate the relationships of the natural world, the human world, with the supernatural realm and bringing those in alignment. As an example of this animal belief and Native American forager cosmology, the way in which Native people saw the universe as being a reverse of primal times. During earliest times, animals and humans were the same. Humans were animals, animals were humans. They were one and the same, and there was a unity to the cosmos. These memories, these oral traditions, these myths, talk to us about how the animals gave their bodies to the people agreeing to become food because of their kinship, their relationship, their connection between humankind. These particular stories, songs, and rituals really recall or tell us about this earliest era when animals danced, sang, and rejoiced. As an example, there is a story that the Kauaias, the Southern Paiute people who live in the Tehachapis in California, Southern California, believe at their creation site. At the creation site, there's a hole there in a cave, and they believe that they came from that the tribe, the ancestors, and their people originated from that hole. Also, when you look on the rocks, there's paintings. The stories are told that it was during the time of the original creation when Grizzly Bear called a party. He sang a song and invited everyone there. And he had invited all his animal friends. And they were to decide at that time who they were going to be. The jackrabbit was there. The turtle was there. The uh, red racer snake, the rattlesnake the deer, the bighorn sheep, they all came. And they had a great party, and it was all hosted by the uh, grizzly bear. <laughs> and so, if you look on the walls of the cave, there are pictures, paintings, of all these various animals. And as well, when you look at the landscape there, around the cave, you can see the preserved forms of those animals. You look at one rock, it looks like a big horned sheep. You look at another rock, it's a turtle. You look at another rock, it's a bird. There's also a depiction of, of a um, jackrabbit, etc. So the landscape and the paintings and the stories hearken to this unification, this kinship this tremendous connection. This picture here is a picture of a world renewal ceremony by the Northwest Coast 
Californians, the Karuk, the Karak, or the Hoopa. And those are white deerskin skins that they have on those poles, and they're celebrating the uh, beginning of the new year. Here again, we'll see the, these are the Karuk, Hoopa, and Yurok Indians. They're having the white deerskin world renewal cult. And again, they're venerating their ancestors and also praying for the new life in the new year and that, that the uh, deities, the supernatural, would, be, would bless them both with abundant game and longevity for the people and continuous prosperity. With respect to the affinity of animals and people, there is a kinship here. There is a tendency for Native Americans to imitate animals in how they dress, in their actions, and even in their thoughts. If we characterize or think about the cycle of the seasons, of the day and the night, the, and sort of a revitalization of human and animal life being accomplished, there is an embedded animal ceremonialism in Native American religions. Why is that the case? Well, one of the central reasons is that certain animals, principally those that are, I call them indexical animals, these are the animals that are hunted in the main or perceived as prominent in the oral traditions of Native people. They do not die, but they're reborn. So animals are killed and their spirits go into an underworld home or a celestial kingdom. And they are reborn anew each season. So in this cycle, there's a cycle of what's called descent and ascent. So the first, first half of the ceremonial cycle is associated with a death a, and also a, a movement into the underworld. So when an animal is killed and slain by a hunter, often what happens is they take the skull and venerate it, and they have what's called a post-mortem funeral for the animal. That skull can be showcased on a pole or in a tree or above on a high point. And this is then a way of acknowledging reverence and the uh, thanking the animal spirit for donating its life and allowing the native people to continue. This is a petroglyph a rock drawing in my research area of the Kosos. And so what I believe here is you see the veneration, the showcasing of the animal skull on the pole. You see the animal that's been hunted using an up model, using a weapon, a spear with a weight on it, a dart. And then here you see the spirit of the animal going down into the underworld, yet returning later on into the hands of the hunter. And we see sort of this cosmic pole down below that is probably a power pole that allows one to garner the mysteries of the universe and allow this particular cycle to occur. Now besides this cyclic death and descent and post-mortem funeral, other benchmarks that occur throughout the season is you have in the autumn, in the fall, usually a communal feast, when you can have sufficient food to aggregate people. And during this time, you'll have a, a group get together and do a pantomime dance of the animals and sing. And also during that time is when you have what's called ancestor worship, where the individuals that have passed on into the sky world are revered and communicated with and then you have some sort of a mourning ceremony in association with the commemoration of the dead. 
The second half of the cycle, you have the descent, you have the ascent. In the spring is a time of renewal, world renewal. And during this time, the ceremonies and the rituals and the religious traditions show that this was a time that we bring the humans back into harmony with the universe. The emphasis during the second half of the season is on rebirth, on the multiplication of game resources, on a renewal of life, so on birth, on longevity, on the continued success of a tribe in its way of life. And anthropologists call this particular package of traditions increased rights. This is the time when those spirit animals, those animals that had passed away into the underworld, into the netherworld, through underworld portals, reemerge into the natural world, the human world. So, in understanding this cycle, there is a prominent deity, a supernatural, a supramundane being that is central all across the world and plays a prominent place in the cosmology, in the worldview of Native people. And, then, and this person, this being, is called an animal master or an animal mistress. This supernatural guardian is uh, especially characteristic of a lot of the cultures in the desert west, the American Southwest, and even into Mexico. But we've also understand that they're also in South America and also in the old world as well. These uh, supernatural beings are featured in prehistoric rock art and also in religious symbolism and they're portrayed in certain hunting ceremonies. For native people, rocks and the rock canvas, the uh, natural terrestrial uh, landforms are in fact not a solid thing as we would think they would be, but our portals or envelopes or curtains dividing the layered world. So the world is seen as a, in at least three levels. There's a netherworld, an underworld, there's a terrestrial world, and then there's a sky world. So these rocks are seen as curtains dividing the world. Before the hunt, hunters offer sacrifices to this animal master asking permission to take one of his creatures. After the hunt, rituals occur again and the animal master is thanked or acknowledged for sending the catch and allowing for the capture of one of his animals. Again, tied to this presentation of offering and sacrifice and this cyclic nature of the universe. This concept of time and regeneration is intimately connected as a core paradigm, a core central belief system. And this moves into other areas besides just the superficial. Since they are so intimately entwined with death and rebirth, one of the most uh, powerful of the elements that Native people deal with is the bones. And in fact, they plant the skeletal remains of hunting animals. And in planting those bones, by planting or placing them and treasuring them and, and concentrating them, this is seen as a source of new life. The skulls were believed to be the most animated or living or embodying the energies associated with animal ancestors. So this animal skull was tremendously full of power and it had to be treated appropriately. So when the animal master living in the animal underworld and after they are killed by the hunters, this animal master, this master of the animals, this mistress of game 
is specifically responsible for their regeneration. So if we're to sort of look at this in a broad way, how can we understand cross-culturally Native Americans, they believe in the animal master, they believe in a symbolic connection and unification of bones with regeneration, they believe in ceremonies designed to placate this animal master to ensure this regeneration through rituals and through the secondary discard of these animal remains. And although uh, a particular concept has been grossly maligned throughout and talked about as being silly, there is something called hunting magic. So if we look at forager hunting religions, we're talking about the concept of animal ceremonialism. We're talking about an emphasis on the spiritual power of the universe. We're talking about annual ceremonies of cosmic rejuvenation, intimately time, you know, connected with shamanism and animism, an emergence tradition, talking about creating creation narratives centering on the peopling of the world from the interior of the earth and multiple levels of the cosmos, a layered universe. Those are also key characteristics of native religions and how they think about the world and their religious precepts. Let's go one step further. There's a famous article, it's called Amerindian Perspectivism. And it's a very difficult article to get through. It's done by some, by some Mesoamerican scholars. And what they're trying to do is teach us a bit about what is distinctive about Native American religious thought and the way Native people, Indigenous people think about the world. And so I'm going to try to just touch upon that in just a brief way and try to uh, emphasize the distinctiveness of Native American philosophy, worldview, cosmology, and religious traditions. So gods, deities, spirits, and the supernatural, it lives and is active in the physical world. So contrary to our understanding as God being on high or separated in a different world, for native indigenous people, gods, God, deities, and the supernatural is entwined with their lives and inhabit the terrestrial world. In other words, religion is life and life is intimately connected religiously to all facets of existence. Animals are key. Animals are equivalent to humankind. Animals are people and people are animals. Now that may sound like something we would say in a scientific way. And yes, I understand that particular way of thinking, but this is a different way of thinking because these animals are recognizing as having souls and spirits and the same exact fashion as people. Animals have families, they have leaders, they have homes, they have languages, and animals are considered kin. Native people in the Americas believed the original state at the time of the creation was that there was this unity between animals and people. Animals lost just certain qualities that were retained by humans. And so animals are indeed ex-humans, not the other way around. Native Americans see the world as highly transformational. Shamans have the ability to turn themselves into animals. Animals have the ability to transform into other different animals. Spirits can come, supernatural spirits can come as animals. And native people can recognize themselves as descended and kin from key ancestor animals or animal persons. And in anthropological parlance, this is called totemism. 
Now, something else is a little bit different about Native American thought. Native Americans identify in pre-contact times and traditional belief systems with their own diversity. They believe the humanity, the humankind ceases at the boundary of their own group. So in other words, if there's another group outside that speak a different language, they're not perceived as, as one of them. So strangers are not seen as real humans. Native people perceive only their own group and identity as true humans. I know that that's a, a very foreign concept, but that's traditionally the way Native people thought about the world. Here's a case study. I'll bring it full, full term. When I studied the native people of Eastern California, a group called the Kauaisu, Southern Paiute speakers, these were Numic or a branch of Uto Aztecan in the Tehachapi Mountains, they had a series of oral traditions, a series of sacred narratives, mythology, call it. And one of their more, most prominent central beings, supernatural beings, was a deity or a supramundane being called Yahuera. Now, Yahuera was a Kawaiisu animal master. Now, what was interesting about this being, besides being very well documented in the oral traditions of the native people, is on the landscape, there was a place called Yahuera Canina, which was the home of the animal master. This home was a island of limestone. And this limestone island existed there within a well-watered canyon. And that canyon is called Back Canyon, and it's within the, um, the area of the Tehachapi Mountains. It's called Back Canyon. So, on that particular site, this back canyon in Walker Basin, Tatchby Mountains, there is a painting that exists there. It's a four foot tall, decorated animal human figure. Now, there, on that rock, on that limestone pillar, that 40 foot tall limestone pillar, we have the depictions of beings, non-human beings, and we have snakes, and we have uh, indications that this is a portal by showing you the concentric circles that exist on that particular limestone block. In the traditional story told about Yahuera, the master of the animals, that was the entrance to his home. Now, there wasn't any sort of a, a rock shelter or cave or true entrance, but it was the belief of the native people that that was one of the portals to the underworld. There were other portals to the underworld where this being lived, but this was the main portal. So what did the story tell us in terms of the Native American view? Well, when you go down in that portal, the first thing that you might see is you would see the horns or the antlers of the animals that were slain. And they would be piled up at the mouth of this cave, this tunnel. And as you moved into that particular cave, you would also then see bows and arrows they'd be showcased on the edges of the cave. In the uppermost portions of the cave, you would see the successful bows and arrows of the hunters who were successful in killing the game. And at the bottom, you would see the loser, <laughs> the ones that were less uh, fortunate. You would go through there into the cave and you would have to go across and go over the guardians of the cave. 
at the beginning of the cave, they were both uh, animals. They were uh, different kinds of, of uh, game animals. And they, even though they would be able to speak. So there was both um, two kinds of, of uh, game animals. They were both, both bears and they both were also the, uh, the snakes. And there was a, a rattlesnake and also a gopher snake. But also, as I said, on the luck on the cave walls, you would see the prominent bows and arrows and the inferior bows and arrows. Here you would see the gopher snake that was there as a guardian, and you'd continue to walk through the tunnel. You would then also see the rattlesnake, and it was as big as a log, and you'd climb through that particular portal as well. Then you'd see the bears. You'd see the brown bear, and you'd see the grizzly bear. Then you wouldn't see any more animals. You keep walking, and then you would meet with Yahwera, the animal mistress or animal master. Now, when the native people dreamed or had dreams, or when they at night might see this animal, the animal would come, this being, as a yellow bird or a small hawk. Yahwera, the animal master, would wear a mountain quail feather blanket or some sort of a mountain quail skirt. If the man was searching, the person who went in to meet Yahwera was sick or wanted to improve his ability to hunt or live a better life, Yahwera knew all about this and he would offer his hospitality and provide acorn mush, pinion, food, or deer meat, and it would come in limitless supply. It would keep reappearing. And every time you'd eat it, it would be replenished. Yahwera would take the visitor into a room where he kept medicine. Now, the medicine were songs, and he wanted, and we, he knew that this uh, visitor, this, uh, you know, guest was there to gain help, and so he would show him all the various songs and he would name them. And the man would select a song as his gift and his blessing and he would want to return home. He would go through and leave Yahweh's home. He would continue going into and out of this domain, this home, and he would see it as a tunnel. He would see a veil of water like a window wasn't really water, he wouldn't get wet, but he would go through that veil and he would come out of that home and he'd found that he would exit in the desert somewhere else entirely where he hadn't entered. So he's, so he's coming in one place but leaving another. Two of the places that he would exit would be a place called Red Rock Canyon, which was a place of rather spectacular landforms and colorful rocks or a little lake where there was a natural small lake. When he left the home of Yahweh, he was no longer uh, unlucky, he was no longer sad, he wasn't sick anymore, and he was transformed. He'd been gone for a very long time, and his relatives didn't know where he had been. How does that relate to some of the archaeology and some of the prehistory? Well, in that same region where those native people live, we have the largest concentration of prehistoric rock drawings in the Western Hemisphere. It's a place called Coso. And in this Eastern California area, we have a place which in a very tight concentration, about 100 square miles or less, we find a startling realistic record of the prehistoric native behavior for thousands of years, including their religious views, decorating the rocks. Many of these particular figures that are shown on the rocks are animals. They're bighorn sheep. About 40% of the imagery is sheep. And also, probably the second most frequent class of pictures seen on the rocks are what's called decorated animal humans. There's over 700 of them, these particular beings. And you can see these particular figures 
in open air galleries along the canyon rims and also concentrated in a canyon called Little Petroglyph Canyon or Lower Renegade Canyon. These decorated animal humans are often avian humans, bird humans. There's bird men, there's bird women, they have avian legs, avian feet, and also sometimes tail feathers. You see them with hunting gear. They may have spears, they may have spear throwers, they've also got bolo stones or have some sort of ceremonial staff of power that may be a digging stick or a planting stick or even a burial spade. We'll see that one arm is bent, another arm is up. And we also see them with headdresses, with feathers or quail plumes, very, very commonly. We also see these figures intimately associated with snakes. Snakes are inside their torsos. They're accompanying themselves with snakes. They, we see them with blankets, bowls of seeds. We see images of both men and women, and even two spirits, sort of androgynous creatures. They're all intimately connected. Here's some examples of those figures. We can see the bird legs, the bird's feet, the tail feathers, or the fringe at the bottom of the figures. Here we can see some of the quail plumes adorning those figures and the feathers of their headdresses. And we see the fringed garments, which are also characteristic of shamans, even throughout the world. So in one way or other, we can say that these look like shamans, but in another way, could they in fact perhaps be an animal master-like figure? Here we see some other figures along the same realm. Here's the quail feathers. Here we see the fringe at the bottom. We also see the weaponry for hunting, centrally associated with these figures. And to conclude, these iconic images are ancient. They go back to, let's say, as early as 4000 BC, or maybe even earlier. But most of the images are in a period called Newberry period, and this is a period of time when animals, particular big game animals, were considered to be centrally important, both in terms of the religious cosmology, the ceremonialism, their, decor their decorations and their art forms, and also in the foods that they had. We see that, uh, we can say that because when we've studied this particular region, we see that there are sheep trap complexes, we have hunting behavior and hunting features. We have dummy hunters exposed in the uh, areas that they were hunting. And oral tradition suggests that perhaps what we're seeing here is this animal ceremonialism, this group of increased rights, and this complementary meaning of this shamanic hunting magic that was perhaps characteristic of these ancient precursors of the historic people, these uh, Udo Aztecan population, sharing their culture, sharing their passions, their religious passions on the rocks and mirroring in an artistic tradition the nature of the traditional religious views of the American Indians as we've characterized them here. All right. And that's it. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Garfinkel. We've had uh, one attendee um, show up, so we'll give her a chance to ask some questions in a second. Melinda, I'm going to unmute your uh, – I see you're connected by phone. I'll do that in a second here. But um, first, let's get the questions started. Um, Alan, I got a comment on religion. It's something I was thinking about in the first part of the presentation. It's almost a – a joke to archaeologists to say when they don't understand something, they say it must be religious or ceremonial, <laughs> which means they say, they say it's an ideotechnic artifact. Or it's, right. It's, it's ceremony, but it's religious, right? Exactly. Like we don't know what it is, therefore ceremony or religious or something like that, um, which leads us to believe that, you know, there still is a lot we don't know about ceremony and religion. But I mean, given this whole presentation, is it, is it, is what allows you to do something like this and to have this much information um, really because of the similarities across the world with 
most of these religions or is it some just have better information than others or, you know, how can we go back 2000 years and say we know what they were thinking from a religious standpoint? You know, it's interesting. Um, as we begin to study more and more of native culture, native religion, we found that uh, certain, certain civilized cultures throughout the world preserve the central core theological precepts of their ancestors, like the Hopi, like the Weechel. If you think about it, even in, in contemporary world religions, isn't it amazing to think that when we celebrate Hanukkah or when we worship uh, Christ, that we're seeing a connection of central ideology, religious views that have continued uninterrupted for a minimum of 2,000 years. So the same imagery, the same particular uh, belief systems and the ideology and the sacred narratives continue in unbroken form for thousands of years. Hmm. And as we begin to recognize that, we can see how relevant those cultures are that have preserved an archaic way of life, an archaic set of traditions, and we can compare those particular beliefs, ideologies, values, and glean that there's this thread, mm -hmm. there's, this, there's this almost a cosmic thread that connects prehistory to history, connects the archaeological record with the ethnographic and historic record. And I right. see when I'm walking into Little Petroglyph Canyon, and I see on the wall of the canyon a picture of a dead sheep with a spear in it, upside down and bloated. And, <laughs> and under that, a mother sheep with a baby. It's rather obvious. This, right. is, this is death. This is life. And there's something about those. It, it seems to connect me across the thousands of years, the centuries and millennia. These are people, and they have the same wants, the same hopes, the same yearnings, the same values as I did. What do we want? Well, we want to live. We want to be able to procreate and have healthy children. We want to be able to eat. We want to be able to survive. We want to be able to uh, feel joy in our lives. And that's all perceived in the archaeological record and also in the ethnographic record. Right. Okay. Well, uh, I do want to open this up. Melinda, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Um, otherwise, we'll just uh, push on here. Excuse me. No questions at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining. Um, all right, Alan. Well, thank you for the uh, great presentation. Um, as, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, it will be available, Melinda, and to the other people well, that to anybody who paid for this, it will be available after the fact um, to watch in its entirety uh, as much as you want. You'll be sent the login information soon. Alan, anything else before we shut off? No, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share my passionate understanding of Native American religion and sort of take a deep dive into the mysteries. And hopefully from this discussion, you can begin to perceive how even though we are hundreds centuries and millennia apart, there's this almost cosmic thread that connects us to those who came before. And in some ways, the places that Native people venerated have a significance and value for us even today. Outstanding. All right. Well, thank you. And check Team Black website, arccert.black, for other webinars coming up in 2019. Thank you, Alan. And Melinda, thank you for attending.